Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for logging in. Uh, we're going to be listening and watching a very interesting uh, presentation by Dr. Mike Bruton uh, on a very interesting, fascinating subject. And uh, we hope we will all enjoy it very thoroughly. All right. Well, thank you once again for this opportunity to for me to address the GSSA. It's a great pleasure uh, being part of your community. You may remember that the last talk I gave to you was on the life and work of Marjorie Courtney Latimer, whose biography, Curator and Crusader, I had published at the time. And I'm hoping that sometime in the future, I'll also be able to speak to you about another biography I wrote of two people, Professors JLB and Margaret Smith, the famous fish scientists um, from Rhodes University who led very colorful lives. Now, the talk I'm giving you today is based on a chapter in this book. The book is called Curious Notions, Reflections of an Imagineer, and was published late last year by Footprint Press um, of Cape Town. Here's the table of content, and you can see it consists of a series of essays that I've written on my various involvements in science and technology. And one of those um, essays is called, Who is South Africa's Greatest Inventor? And in this chapter, I evaluate the credentials of a number of people, past and present, uh, to come up with the winner. Now, of course, inventions have been part of South African and African culture for millennia. Uh, the first controlled use of fire about 1.1 million years ago, uh, evidence for that has been found in Southern Africa. Early tools made by Homo habilis um, are extremely common um, in our part of the world. And in particular, along the coastline where over 3000 middens uh, have been found, which is basically the sort of kitchen and household waste from um, people who lived along the coast and exploited uh, marine resources. They were essentially uh, the first techno hubs. Other firsts um, in our part of the world include the oldest known abstract artwork, the scratched ochre piece that was found in Blombos Cave by Professor Henschelman and his team from Fitz. This lunar stick, which is thought to be the oldest known mathematical device in the world, where someone has carved 28 notches on the femur of a baboon, was found in um, Border Cave up in northern Zululand. And of course, the extraordinary uh, gold plate work done on the Golden Rhino from Mapungupwe uh, up in the northern uh, Limpopo province from about a thousand years ago. Some of these traditional inventions are still in use today, such as the Isifonia thrust baskets used up in the Pongola floodplain. And of course, many uh, aspects of traditional knowledge have been fashioned into modern products that are sold all over the world, such as the extracts from the hoodia plant, uh, which is a diet suppressant. We all know about rooibos tea, uh, which has been used as an infusion for tens of thousands of years but it was actually a, a Russian immigrant, Benjamin Ginsberg, who saw its potential as a commercial team. And the CSIR has uh, brought to the market many inventions based on traditional knowledge. One of them is uh, these mosquito-based uh, uh, mosquito repellent candles uh, based on the sap of a tree that's traditionally used to repel uh, mosquitoes. Now, in the various books that I've written on South African inventions, I discuss inventors, I discuss over 400 of them. And here's a sort of um, a gallery of, of culprits. Uh, I'm sure you'll recognize some of them. I must point out that I'm not including Elon Musk in my evaluation of who is our greatest scientist. And he is a phenomenal person, Time Magazine's 2021 Man of the or Person of the Year and described in a covering article as probably the most interesting person in the universe. Uh, although he was born in South Africa and uh, developed some early uh, computer games here, most of his inventions have been made abroad. 
So these are some of the shortlisted candidates uh, that I mention in this chapter in my book. And just going clockwise uh, from the left, uh, James Henry Greathead, um, who developed the tunneling system for the London Underground. Jack Rose uh, developed extraordinary transportation methods for the Boer War and the First and Second World War. Basil Shondland, uh, who developed radar and many other applications. Uh, Trevor Wadley, um, Aaron Kluch, Dalolo Moyayo, and um, Siu Bulele Kuzai. Uh, just to mention in a little bit more detail some of the work of those inventors. James Greathead is a farmer's son from Grahamstown. He studied for a while at Bishops before immigrating to the USA, where he developed um, the apparatus for drilling the tunnels of the London Underground. And there on the right, you can see a large statue of him um, in the city of London, where he is seen as the father of the London Underground. And there's an illustration of the Great Head Shield in use. Uh, Jack Rose uh, was an, a champion cyclist who developed a bicycle that could ride on railway lines. It was extensively used uh, in the anglo boer War uh, for reconnaissance of spying and bringing the wounded back from the, from the war front. And just as an interesting sidelight, I'm busy helping to develop a museum on the history of the bicycle at the Tra Trails and Bike Hotel in Prabo, and we've been able to obtain um, this personal war cycle that Jack Rose made himself in 1902 for display in the museum. Basil Shondlin, well known for his work on, on radar, and, and, and Trevor Wadley was a junior member of his team, and of course uh, the co-inventors of the um, PET scanner, Alan Cormack, South Africa's first nuclear scientist, and Godfrey Hounsfield, uh, who was a medical technologist uh, in England. So there's the CAT scanner, which basically brought medicine uh, into the information age, uh, and you'll find one in virtually every major hospital in the world. Now you might wonder what the Beatles are, are doing there. Well, Godfrey Hounsfield in England um, worked for a company that had two divisions, a medical research division and a music recording division. And it so happened that the insanely uh, profitable Beatles uh, had been contracted uh, by the company at that time. And the profits from the sale of Beatle records were used partly to sponsor the CAT scanner. And then I also mentioned Lodox. Lodox is a low dose X-ray machine developed by De Beers in South Africa. Um, to prevent theft of diamonds uh, from their mines, especially in Namibia. And it was used for what they, they said, reducing the risk of miners using diamonds as a, mullet, as a dietary supplement. Um, other inventors of note, uh, Percy M. Wiles, uh, the inventor of the cryorobe for, for eye uh, surgery. Uh, Dave Woods and his team, various wind-up uh, medical apparatus. And of course, the famous Dolos, which is deployed in over 120 countries around the world. And just about every uh, successful pump powered pool cleaning equipment uh, was invented in South Africa and exported. But let's get on to the main subject of our talk, Trevor Wadley. Uh, he was born in Durban in 1920, the youngest son of 10 children, so in a very large family. His father, Thomas Wadley, was a, a highly respected accountant and a mayor of Durban, uh, who was, uh, held a very high position in his community. But Thomas was very supportive of Trevor Wadley's um, interests in, in telecommunications, in radio equipment, etc., cetera, and, and, and encouraged him all along the way. However, the same cannot be said of his mother, Florence, and I do not know Florence's maiden name, and maybe one of the expert genealogists, genealogists in your society could help me track down Florence's maiden name. She was a dominatrix who disapproved of Trevor's rebelliousness and constantly you know, dis discouraged uh, his tinkering and experiments, and uh, the two of them did not get on well. Uh, 
Trevor Wadley's younger sister, Mary, I had the good fortune to meet. And I'll tell you about her uh, in a moment. And um, in terms of his education, he was educated at Durban High School and then at Howard College, where he obtained his BSc in engineering in 1940. Now, um, I'm gonna read a little bit from my book about uh, Wadley's early development. And a lot of it is from this marvelous little biography that Mary Wadley von Hirschberg, uh, his youngest sister, uh, wrote. And here she is, I met her uh, when she was 80 years old, celebrating her birthday in Cape Town. She currently lives in Swaziland. And over a few too many gin and tonics, we discussed her brother, which she called the little genius. And these are some uh, bits of information that I gleaned from her book. His kindergarten teacher described Trevor as independent and original. Conduct fairly good, but he must learn to sit still sometimes. But he was com commended later in school for his brilliance in mathematics. Trevor was not interested in sport, except on one occasion when he entered a cross-country athletics race and predicted that he would win in record time and that his record would stand for 15 years. His training method involved calculating the time he needed to run each section of the course and then uh, training himself to run at the required pace for each section. And he went on to do exactly as he had predicted. From childhood, Wadley was the ultimate tinkerer who liked to take things apart and put them together again, often in a different configuration. He was also an adventurous risk-taking youth who delighted in climbing to the top of the giant bohonia trees in the garden and gazing out over the Ungani Valley to the chatter of vervet monkeys. In summer, the Wadley kids would sleep on the veranda, except on nights when a leopard was reported in the vicinity. Trevor was forever carrying out experiments using the simplest apparatus. In 1932, the 12-year-old stood on the veranda, vigorously rotating a syrup tin, Look, Mary, centrifugal force, he said to his younger sister. He once wired the family telephone to the radio in the lounge so that he could listen in on his sister's phone calls to her fiancé. Now, one of the interesting points that Mary Wadley made about her, her brother, and with which I agree, is that when one is trying to ascertain the character traits and true interests that will define a person's future career. One should look at what that person was most passionate about at the age of about 12 to 13 years. At this age, Trevor took infinite pains in pulling to pieces, examining, constructing, and poring over any type of machinery, particularly electric, uh, electrical and radio equipment. He also refused to engage himself in anything that did not interest him, but pursued re relentlessly anything that did. This characteristic he carried through into adult life, and he nearly failed his matric examination en route. In fact, he realized that he wasn't going to pass Latin, so four months before the matric exam, he taught himself chemistry through after-hour studies, and to everyone's amazement, he achieved an A in chemistry, as well as in physics and mathematics. In the 1960s, the then president of the CSIR, Dr. Stefan Mehring Laudier, asked Mary to explain her brother's genius to him. And she emphasized that academic brilliance may be misleading as it could lead an individual into a career for which he or she is temperamentally unsuited, in which case success comes at the expense of happiness. In her brother's case, he chose a career for which he was ideally suited, and as a result, he lived his working life in a state of euphoria, so happy to have been afforded the means and opportunity to exercise his special talents. At Durban High School, he was regarded as a brilliant student who never took notes in lectures, but clearly understood every concept and could derive any formula from memory. In examinations, and, and now I'm sorry, I'm talking now about Howard College. In examinations, he did not confine his answers to the minimum number of questions required, but answered every question, usually achieving scores of over 
Uh, um, the, first, the Second World War broke out when uh, Wadley was uh, just 19 years old and he immediately enlisted. And he served in the special signal section uh, services of the Signal Corps. And he carried enormous responsibility in this role because he was responsible in the field in North Africa and in the Sinai, not only for uh, repairing um, radios that broke down in the field, but also for upgrading them and constantly ensuring that the messages uh, could be received loud and clear. And the respect with which uh, he was treated is shown by the fact that in the short space of four years, he was promoted from lieutenant to major. One of his major roles was to intercept um, enemy radio messages uh, from Germany, from Japan, and also from submarines. And his radio address was appropriately opposite London. I'm gonna read a bit more about his war experiences. In March, 1941, he was assigned to the Sinai ostensibly as a station commander of a radar station, but it is clear from contemporary accounts that his responsibilities were far more important than that. Wherever he went, Wadley carried with him a powerless, powerful wireless set or radio with which he could send secret messages to the cabinet war room at Whitehall. He also intercepted enemy radio messages from Germany, Japan, and submarines, and transferred them to London, which contributed significantly to the Allies' ability to preempt enemy moves. The powerful radio in his tent in the desert was also to use to broadcast Churchill's inspirational uh, speeches to the troops. And he visited uh, the British capital for radio and radar training, at least on, on at least one occasion in 1941. Interestingly, in 1948, after the war, at the University of Cape Town graduation ceremony, Field Marshal Jan Smuts, who was then Chancellor of the University, said to Mary Wadley, I know your brother, he is a genius. He contributed to the development of radar units in South Africa at a cost of half a million pounds, they did the job of British units that cost us a million. He is a genius, but do not tell him, it might give him a swollen head. And these comments were made when Wadley was only 28 years old and the full flowering of his technical genius was still to come. So in summary, he, he made a major contribution to the war effort through his expertise on both radio um, and radar. And, but it's actually quite difficult to find out details because a lot of this is still uh, confidential. Right, after the war, immediately after the war, he was invited to join the staff of the newly formed telecom communications um, a research laboratory that had been established by the CSR um, in 1946, which is also the, the year that the CSR was established. And he was recognized for his genius in, in, in designing and improving radio and radar, and that's the task um, that he carried out. And although he was very technically gifted, he was a very pleasant personality as well, and apparently a playful and competitive character with a great sense of humor. Um, and let me read a bit about that from the book. In the work environment, Wadley was playful and competitive. Once a technician asked him to borrow a piece of equipment, Wadley agreed, but insisted that he leave his shoes behind um, as a deposit. In 1962, he bet his colleagues on a Friday that he would arrive at work on Monday in an electric car. He spent the weekend creating a crude but workable three-wheeled battery powered vehicle, you can see that top left, and lived up to his promise. He enjoyed spending tea breaks, bouncing his sometimes eccentric ideas off other staff, always displaying a profound understanding of matters electrical, and often came up with novel solutions to intractable problems through his thought experiments, which are reminiscent of Albert Einstein. Wadley was often accused of constantly criticizing or attacking cherished beliefs and was very argumentative. If there was no contretemps in the offing, 
he would provoke one by assumingly assuming an seemingly indefensible position and then proceeding to defend it with great skill. He was also a betting man, but not a gambler and always won his bets. Punctuality was not his strong point. He was often a couple of hours late for work and he rebelled against strict office hours and other forms of bureaucracy. But he worked long hours, thinking with an audible whisper and achieved phenomenal gains. Throughout his life, nothing delighted him more than to amaze his audience with the novel, brilliant or outrageous solutions or scenarios that he had conjured up. He also enjoyed tackling new talent challenges. He taught himself to knit and sew and to play the piano and mouth organ and even made his own electronic organ and telescope. Right, so now let's now move on to Wadley's career. And there you can see him in an early photograph of the 1950s, entertaining his work colleagues uh, from the Telecommunications Research Lab and the CSRR. During the war, uh, Wadley developed a number of innovations which led to uh, products that could later uh, go on the market. The ionosond, uh, which uh, was able to document the behavior of the ionosphere, was a very important post war, war development. The ionosphere is that part of the atmosphere that has enough free electrons that allow radio waves to bounce off it. And it is what makes it possible for short wave radio um, communications to be achieved uh, around the globe. So what this machine uh, documented and, and measured the behavior of the ionosphere and uh, was used for decades after that in that regard. The Wadley loop was something he also developed uh, straight after the war, uh, something for a circuit for cancelling frequently drift. And then he developed an extraordinary series of radios, uh, which I've named there, and I'll illustrate um, as we go along. So there he, uh, is uh, Trevor Wadley uh, with his ionosond. There's the uh, modern version of the Wadley loop receiver, which is uh, still an important uh, innovation. And here's the prototype of the Bar Barlow Wadley broadband radio. And of course, he worked in both crystal and, and transistor radios during that transition. And many of the radios that he produced became the world standard. And they were used by radio hams, but also the larger rack receivers and so on were used by the BBC for international broadcasts, including to South Africa. And um, his radios for military applications were widely used by the military in Britain and other countries. Uh, he has his famous uh, XCR30, uh, uh, it's a crystal controlled receiver invented in 1959 and uh, which is still extremely popular uh, with radio hams. But despite all those amazing um, inventions of different kinds of radios and rack receivers, what his greatest invention was still to come, and that was the telurometer. And what had happened is that the head of the trigonometric survey office had approached the CSRR and said, ask them to develop a more accurate distance measuring machine using radio waves. Um, this task was inevitably assigned to Trevor Wadley. And in an extraordinarily short period of time, less than three months, he came up with a solution. And although the principle of the telurometer, which means earth measurer, is very simple, the practical application of those principles was extremely complex. And he was essentially the only person in the world who could develop this instrument. And for nearly 30 years, the radio telurometer was the most accurate distance measuring device in the world. Not only was it accurate, but it was small and portable. It did not require measuring lines to be cleared of vegetation. It could be used the day and night. Uh, it could be used from the land, or also from helicopters, fixed wing aircraft and ships, and even from artificial islands. It totally revolutionized distance measuring around the world and uh, was subsequently used in over 60 countries. It's estimated that over 20,000 telurometers were sold uh, earning South Africa more than 300 million um, 
rand in foreign earnings in 1960s terms. So there we, we see Trevor uh, with his characteristic hat gazing through the telerometer. Uh, he was a short man, 1.54 meters tall, but an absolute giant in the field of te telecommunications. And here he is in England uh, demonstrating uh, the telerometer. He's uh, whizzing around a um, device for measuring uh, humidity because that's one of the uh, adjustments that you had to make uh, when you're making measurements. And he wasn't shy to boast about his inventions. Um, he was invited to remeasure the line on Salisbury Plain uh, that was used as a basis for all British uh, surveying and trigonometry. And he announced to uh, the British Prime Minister Macmillan that he, their line is 1.5 meters incorrectly measured as proven uh, by uh, his telerometer. Um, here's uh, another picture of a telerometer uh, demo um, in England. And the British Prime Minister was heard to say at the time, it seems so obvious, why didn't one of our scientists invent this apparatus? Uh, Wadley uh, traveled the world demonstrating the telerometer in other European countries, um, in the Far East and also in North America. And eventually it was taken up as a standard long distance measuring device in the world. And here he's demonstrating the telerometer to the British Prime Minister, Howard Macmillan, during uh, Macmillan's visit to South Africa in 1960. And uh, Macmillan was a great fan of Wadley. Our telerometers um, have been made in South Africa by a company called Tellur Tellurometer, uh, now Cellumat, based in Cape Town. It was an exceptionally um, important import, uh, export from South Africa. In, first, in fact, the, the first important electrical export ever from South Africa, and it brought South African science and technology um, to the world's attention. Now I mentioned that uh, telerometers uh, could also be used from aeroplanes, and here's one in operation uh, from a fixed wing uh, aircraft. And there's a diagram of how it was used by the US Geological Survey uh, from helicopters. Telerometers were used for a, a wide variety of purposes. For instance, um, plotting the dew line between uh, along the border of Canada and the USA, which is a, a defense system line, surveying the Kabora Bassa Dam, surveying the site of the new uh, Carlton Center um, in Johannesburg, um, surveying the sites of navigational beacons in the Red Sea of Saudi Arabia. It's quite extraordinary how widely it was used. And there you can see uh, different models of the telerometer uh, in use um, in different countries around the world. Some of them on land and some of them on ships. Telerometers also used to um, survey the entire network of roads um, in Nairobi, as well as the network of roads and railways in parts of the USA. There you can see someone in Kenya uh, with the uh, telerometer. And there um, in Wales, bottom left in Greenland, in Canada, and in Switzerland. Um, and because it, he built such a robust machine, Wadley's telerometer could really be used in extremely harsh um, weather conditions uh, without breaking down. There on the left, used in England, uh, top right in, in Fiji, and bottom right in Alaska. So you can imagine what an impact this machine had uh, in the 50s and 60s in terms of the development of South Africans telecommunications and um, electrical industries and the very favorable trading relationships that would develop uh, with countries all over the world. Now every uh, invention is eventually superseded, although Radio telerometers are still used in some applications, for instance, in mine shafts for determining where the lifts in the mine shaft are at the time. But on the whole, the radio telerometer has been replaced by GPS and, and the use of satellites. 
but a smaller, uh, even more accurate kind of telerometer, the infrared telerometer, was developed by another South African called Dirk Bolscher, who lived until he died recently in Simonstein. And this uses infrared and uh, practical over shorter distances, for instance, in surveying harbors or uh, building uh, plots and so on. Uh, but it is still in use today. So there's an image uh, provided to me by Telumat of the full range of uh, telerometers, the older ones on the left going through uh, to the more modern ones on the right, and then along the bottom on the floor, the various examples of Holscher's infrared uh, telerometer. And basically, uh, this machine revolutionized um, long distance and medium distance surveying around the world and it's recognized as one of the greatest inventions in that field. Now, of course, what these achievements were recognized very widely and he received many accolades and awards. During the war, he received the Africa Star and the 1939-45 Star. He also was awarded the very prestigious Frank B. Brown Medal from the Franklin Institution in Philadelphia in the USA. And just for interest, other recent winners of this medal had included the architect Frank Lloyd Wright and the undersea explorer Jean-Jacques Cousteau. What they received honorary doctorates from Witz in 59 and from Cape Town in 76, a gold medal from the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers in 76, and a postage stamp was issued uh, by the South African Post Office in 1979, and you can see that top left there. But interestingly enough, this was not the first postage stamp to depict the telerometer. The Belgians actually produced a postage stamp showing the telerometer in use um, in Antarctica. And I haven't mentioned a number of other uh, less important awards that he received from many science and technology societies. Family life, he married twice. Firstly, to his childhood sweetheart, Madge Sensdiff-Lieben in 1941, and they had two sons. And then he married later in life, uh, when he was 41 years old, um, Jill Duplessis, and they had three daughters. And one of those daughters, uh, Lynn Wadley, uh, is today a, a very prominent archaeozoologist uh, in South Africa. Um, it's quite remarkable that despite all his achievements, Wadley retired from work on uh, telerometers and radio equipment in 1964, at the very young age of 44 years. And with his second wife, Jill, they lived on a small holding at Warner Beach uh, on the south coast of Kozula Natal. And there he busied himself tinkering around, but also was very active in growing vegetables and fruit. And he and his wife were the habit, in the habit of having a little table uh, next to the road that went past uh, their small holding. And it must have been a very odd sight seeing one of South Africa's most greatest geniuses in the technological field uh, selling pawpaws and bananas by the roadside. Wadley uh, died in May 1981 at the young age of 61 of colon cancer. Uh, he was a pipe smoker uh, throughout his life. So that was a rather sad end. So to end, Trevor Wadley, this is the simple inscription on his tombstone, philosopher, scientist, beloved family man, 1920 to 1981. If you want to read more about uh, who I think are South Africa's greatest inventors, and especially Trevor Wadley, uh, please uh, have a look at Curious Notions. My other books on South African inventions include this one published by Cambridge University Press, uh, originally in 2010, 2015, and constantly updated. And then this is a comprehensive book covering over 700 inventors, inventions by 350 plus inventors, um, all South African. What a great idea. And then my most recent book, which is due out next week, is called Harambi, the Spirit of Innovation in Africa, which is an overview of innovation um, from very low tech to very high tech and everything in between. And some absolutely fascinating stories um, are told um, in this book. 
So thank you very much. Thank you for listening. I was going to ask Mike, uh, with the current political and economic situation in South Africa, has the spirit of inventions diminished a lot and are people not uh, rewarded at all for inventing anymore? Has it, a lot, has it changed a lot from what it used to be? No, I think it's stronger than ever. You know, the, uh, in, inventions and innovations are often made during difficult times, for instance, during wartime or during times of economic sanction or political um, isolation. So, you know, my review of African and South African innovation in my two recent books indicates that, you know, we're as innovative as ever and we box well above our weight uh, in the innovation arena worldwide. If I could just give an example of, of the two extremes of innovation that I write about in my book called Arambi, The Spirit of Innovation in Africa. In Botswana, cattle farmers were having a problem with lions from Marami Game Reserve eating their cattle. And they weren't allowed to cull the lions, so they had to devise some non-destructive method of, of protecting their cattle. And in, in collaboration with some researchers from Australia, they decided to paint accurate eyes, big eyes on the rumps of their cattle. And they did a control experiment where a third of several thousand cattle had eyes painted on, a third had just a cross painted on, and the third had nothing. And they found at the end of a few years that not a single one of the cows uh, with an eye on it had been predated on. The ones with a cross had had reduced predation and the ones with nothing the normal rate. And if you compare that low-tech invention and another one I mentioned in Zambia, where beehives are used to keep elephants out of maize fields, at the other end is in Kenya, in the Great Rift Valley, where it's very difficult to erect cell phone towers. They've got what they call internet in the sky, which are helium balloons suspended high up in the sky in a geostationary orbit, um, which act as floating cell phone towers. So those are, that's a sort of range of things that's happening in Africa.